Chapter Nine of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Nine The Judgment while andrew was starting over the hills in the darkness the family had gathered in the hall master mowbray had seen that the drawbridge was raised and that everything was safe for the night audrey soon wondered what had become of aline and after a time made an excuse to get away and went up to their room and down to the secret chamber is not aline here she queried no said ian she has not been down for a long time ian came towards audrey as she spoke why cannot you find her he said no she is not in the hall and not in our room perhaps old elspeth knows i had forgotten her for the moment and audrey's face brightened up i will run and find her this she did at once but aline had not been seen at length audrey felt that she must tell the others so she came back to the great hall and told master mowbray that aline had disappeared stath he exclaimed what has happened to her call the men at once run audrey odds fish man said mistress mowbray one would think the child was an infant that could not take care of itself making such a fuss as that and i do not see that it would be so very great a matter if she were lost why you make as much a to-do about her as though she were your own daughter the hussy is up to mischief and she will see that she does herself no harm master mowbray did not wait for all this but left his wife talking to the empty air the first thing was to rouse all the servants and every room inside was speedily examined but with no result she must have gone out before the gate was shut suggested audrey but that is a very unusual thing she might have gone to speak with one of the servants and crossed the bridge just before it was closed but even if she had walked a little way and not heard them close the gate she would have rung the great bell surely she would not be too frightened to be out after the drawbridge was raised was a very serious fault as every one in the hall knew full well and many a servant had rather run the risk of staying out all night than incur the wrath and penalties that would follow such an offence i hope the child has not come back and walked into the moat said master mowbray it is a terribly dark night come this way he added in a husky voice in his rough way he was fonder of her than he would have admitted even to himself and her spell was increasing its hold upon him they went to the gate and the drawbridge was instantly lowered they then crossed the bridge and divided into two parties taking their lanterns to the right and left audrey accompanied her father to the left and they had not gone ten paces before they came upon aline's little form lying in a broken piece of the moat wall half in and half out of the water it was easy to get down to the water in many places on the outer side although impossible on the inner side master mowbray stepped down and picked up the slight figure and carried it into the hall she had apparently been dead for some time and audrey broke into uncontrollable weeping her whole frame shook violently and it almost seemed that she would choke herself every one stood aghast even mistress mowbray felt something of the atmosphere of grief she was the only one sufficiently unmoved to speak at all but she said poor little lassie that was a hard ending but audrey dear you must try and control yourself you will make yourself seriously ill i do not mind if i do the child sobbed in reply 
oh aline darling aline do not leave me i cannot bear it and she flung herself on to the small still form on the old oak settle and they feared her heart would break by this time every one was weeping even the men servants and mistress mowbray herself but as audrey passionately pressed the cold wet features to her face she suddenly cried out she is not dead i am sure she is not dead i am sure that she still breathes there was a fire in the hall as the summer was getting on and the evenings were chilly up in the moorland district in less time than it takes to say a bed had been made up by the fire and warmed with a warming pan and old elspeth had tenderly undressed the child and put her in the bed while some one else had brought some warm milk elspeth was bending over her and lightly rubbing the damp hair half crooning to herself my bairnie my bonny bairnie wake up my sweetest wake up once more suddenly aline opened her eyes and looked around for a moment and then closed them again she gave no more sign that night and it was an anxious time but hope was strong hardly any one went to bed but mistress mowbray even the servants for the most part wandered about coming every now and then to ask if there was any news the child was a favourite with nearly all of them as much on account of her gentle thoughtful ways as on account of her extreme almost supernatural beauty then there was that strange mysterious power that seemed to hold practically every one with whom she came into contact there were of course one or two who felt her very presence was a sort of standing reproach and who disliked her accordingly but such was the extraordinary sweetness of her disposition that some even in this class found themselves coaxed to a certain extent out of their worse into their better selves against their will in the morning it was apparent that immediate danger was past which caused mistress mowbray to exclaim drat the bairn for frightening us all like that without any reason how stupid of her to fall into the moat as soon as aline was able to talk she had to explain how it happened they had gently moved her to another room and andre and master mowbray were seated at the bedside she had told them of what she had seen and how andrew had thrown her into the water as i fell she went on i felt my head strike violently against something i luckily did not become unconscious at once but was able to scramble through the water to the bank i remember trying to get into a sort of hole in the wall and then i remember no more to this morning but can you swim said master mowbray in blank astonishment as it was not considered a little girl's accomplishment a little bit said aline not too anxious to draw attention to her powers in this direction as after the river tees incident she felt it might be better if they did not know what she was capable of doing i am afraid sire that the man is likely to be the same that took your silver cup and other things she said but i am glad that i have not had my wetting for nothing and that you will be able to stop any more corn being taken master mowbray stooped and kissed her he did not often kiss the children not even audrey as his was not a demonstrative nature poor sweet soul he said how can i repay you for what you have done let us go into the library again said aline at once of course of course he said hastily however we must do something better than that but for the present i must see about those scoundrels andrew woolridge and thomas carluke when thomas heard what had happened on his arrival in the morning he cursed the fates saying to himself why was andrew such a fool as not to go and get a long rod and feel all around that moat side she could never have got out on the inner side but who would have known that the skelpie could swim and he bit his lips in indignation i wonder if they will suspect me 
no andrew is gone i shall be safe but curse her curse her a thousand times andrew had not even dared to go to his own house but had slipped away over the hills at once consequently when they sent down there nothing was known of him news however soon leaked out of what had happened and soon the whole countryside was on his track with the consequence that before three days were spent he was safely lodged in what was known as the lower tower room in the old peel tower on the west side of the hall master mowbray was determined to send him to york to stand his trial as soon as possible but to his great surprise he met with opposition from a very unexpected quarter he went and told aline the next morning after the successful capture and added that his intention was to send andrew to york on the following day but one expecting that the news would give her satisfaction aline did not seem particularly pleased but audrey who was there said oh i am glad they have caught him i hope he will soon be hanged aline looked up rather puzzled isn't that rather bloodthirsty oh no aline dear aline if he had succeeded oh and audrey nearly wept at the bare thought i don't know i'm not sure that people should be hanged of course they should be hanged said master richard aline felt a certain spirit of opposition arising certainly she thought hanging does not seem to be a particularly helpful road to repentance her head ached and she could not think very clearly but of a surety if once she let the man be hanged it would be too late to do anything the others watched her silently for a few moments and then to master mowbray's amazement aline begged with tears in her eyes that he would let andrew off if he would confess all that he had taken and restore it as far as possible and promise to make all the amends that lay in his power master mowbray at first absolutely refused but at last to humour the child promised that he would reconsider the question on the following day if she were better aline was stronger and brighter the next day and when richard mowbray came in to see her she renewed her request you said sire yesterday she began that you would like to do something better for me than just let audrey and me use the library again so i want please to make this my request that you will not punish andrew and thomas if they show that they are really sorry of course if you put it that way child i shall have to do what you ask as far as is possible he sat for a few moments without speaking and then added i have examined into the matter and find that thomas did not actually steal anything himself nor did he get anything out of it but he seems to be a poor cowardly sort of fellow whom andrew used as a tool i might let him stay on in the house if you greatly wish it but i really cannot even if we pardon andrew have him any longer at the hall i think that the man is too violent to be trusted he does not really belong to this neighbourhood at all and it might be possible to send him back to carlisle whence he came that is about all that i can suggest there is a cousin of mine near there who might keep an eye on him and if he gives sign of trouble this could still be kept hanging over him but do you really wish it do you understand child what you are doing yes i really would like it she said then i shall go and speak to the men said mowbray and departed after half an hour he came back again would you mind seeing them he said i think it would be good for them i have told them what you asked and at first they hardly seemed to believe it andrew scarcely said anything though thomas was profuse in his gratitude i will see them if you wish it but it is not easy he looked at the sad little figure and his heart smote him and yet somehow he felt that it was the right thing to do so he went down again and brought up the men 
aileen was propped up on pillows she looked very weak but the wonderful pearly almost translucent complexion that distinguished her had for the moment recovered its usual brilliancy andrew was led in with his hands tied behind his back he looked sullen and sheepish whereas aileen had seldom looked more queenly in spite of her condition thomas was not bound and looked singularly at ease you have both of you behaved most disgracefully master mowbray said in a judicial tone you have meanly taken advantage of the house that had provided you with your livelihood and one of you has committed a crime so vile that it is not for me to find words in which to express my abhorrence if i were doing what my real judgment tells me i should do you thomas for your part would spend a long time in york jail and as for you he continued turning to andrew the world would soon be rid of you altogether however mistress aileen has asked me to give you both another chance as you know but i wanted you first to see the result of your sin and to give you an opportunity of thanking her for what you do not deserve so i have brought you here aileen child tell them what you want them to do it was a very difficult task for the small invalid and master mowbray did not at all realize what he was demanding from the sensitive highly strung little maiden but she nerved herself for the task and tried to forget herself and everything but the men before her oh please andrew she said i only want to tell you that i am feeling much better i shall be all right in a day or two and master mowbray says that you are to go to carlisle where you used to live my father once took me to carlisle when i was a very little girl and it is a fine town much bigger than appleby you should easily find work there and you will not forget will you to send master mowbray something every month to replace the things that have gone master mowbray's cousin will let us know how you are getting on and please sire she continued turning to richard mowbray himself and then looking at andrew's bonds but not mentioning them i want to shake hands with andrew and hope that he will be happy the master of holwick looked at her rather amazed and then untied the rope you will promise to repay what you have stolen he said yes mumbled andrew sulkily now say how grateful you are to her and how sorry you are for what you have done thank you i'm sorry aileen held out her beautiful little hand and smiled sweetly at him andrew stiffly responded and then let his arm fall to his side this was all entirely beyond his comprehension why she did not wish him hanged he utterly failed to grasp what was the use of having one's enemy in one's hands if one did not crush him certainly he thought there were some foolish people who were generally called good who did not behave in that way and who preached to one about one's sins but this child said nothing about his sins and was simply beyond calculation altogether she turned to thomas with the same frank smile to take his hand so you are going to stay with us thomas i wonder whether you would be kind enough to help mistress audrey to look after my falcon while i am ill oh yes indeed mistress aileen he replied i shall never forget your kindness to me may the mother of god bless you for what you have done we are all of us sinners and may god have mercy upon me he kneeled as he spoke and pressed her hand to his lips and added you may be sure that i shall always be ready to serve you to my dying day it will be my lasting honour to carry out your least wish thomas congratulated himself on having escaped so easily and as they were dismissed and were crossing the courtyard he said to andrew she's a soft one and no mistake andrew did not reply he had not recovered his senses she must be a fool he thought and yet she made him look a pretty fool too he was not sure for the moment that he did not hate her more than ever but as he came to think it over in after years the scene would rise before his eyes 
and he would see that fascinating delicate face with pain written all over it and hear the musical voice pleading you will not forget will you end of chapter nine chapter ten of the child of the moat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kate fallis the child of the moat by ian bernard stoughton holborn chapter ten the packman's visit when the men had gone aline lay thinking dreaming building castles in the air what a narrow escape she had had life seemed full of troubles and dangers here was she whose life had been a series of misfortunes and now she had only just escaped death and there was ian whose escape had been as close as her own and who was still in uncertainty and peril he not only had misfortunes but was in danger all the time it must be terrible to live in perpetual anxiety she thought what a pity ian is a heretic she mused it means that he is never safe anywhere and it hinders his chances he is obviously very clever in spite of his humble station only think if he had not been a heretic he might have become a prince of the church after all the great cardinal wolsey was only the son of a butcher and ian is better than that i think his people had a little bit of land why some of these yeomen round here are almost like gentlemen ah but if he had been on the road to a cardinal i should never have seen him and so i should not be interested in him at all now i wonder but i suppose he could hardly be as clever as all that but why should he not become a great doctor in a university and aline drew herself a vivid picture of ian as a sort of abelard gathering thousands of students round him wherever he went but the picture was spoiled when again she remembered that his heresy would stand in the way how cruel they were to abelard she said but mary they are worse now and that was cruel enough then her thoughts turned from abelard to the heart-rending picture of heloise and her love for him she was clever too she thought i should like to be clever like that why should not a girl be clever the lady jane was clever as father was always reminding me and then they chopped off her head alas so is the lady elizabeth's grace i dare say the queen's grace will have her sister's head cut off too i believe the best people always have a sad time poor poor heloise i wonder she reflected if i could ever love like that with absolute entire whole-hearted devotion giving up everything for my love my friends my honour and even the consolations of religion and yet i believe that's the right kind of love not the kind that just lets other people love you well if one can't be clever or love or do anything that is best without suffering then i think i would choose the suffering but oh dear it is very hard i wonder if things get easier as one gets older i am afraid not yet fancy having the praise of one's love sung by all the world hundreds of years after one was dead that must have been a love indeed ah heloise i should like to love like you when i grow older yes i would rather be heloise with all her sorrow than the grand ladies who marry for wealth or position 
or passing affection and do not know really what love is at all yes and i think i should prefer to marry someone very clever someone who really in himself was superior to other men a man with something that couldn't be taken away like riches or titles or outer trappings of any kind yes my knight must be clever as well as brave i should like someone like father but i think i should like him to be great and wealthy too although these other things are best it would be rather nice to be allowed to wear cloth of silver and gold chains footnote the sumptuary laws very strictly regulated what people were allowed to wear according to their rank End of footnote. but i suppose that is very silly i wish father were alive now to help me i should like to be clever myself too and there is no one here who can give me aid master richard does not care about these things i wonder if ian would be any good it's marvellous what he has picked up i wonder if he knows latin but that isn't likely i shall ask him next time i see him but i suppose i really ought to try and sleep now so she fell asleep and dreamed and dreamed that she was dressed in velvet and cloth of silver and a gold chain and a knight in shining armour was kneeling at her feet and calling her his most learned lady aline did not get well very quickly it was not many days before she was able to get up but she was much shaken and easily tired so that she was hardly able to do more than walk a little bit about the house she was quite unequal to going upstairs and although at her particular request she had gone back to her own room richard mowbray himself used to carry her up when it came to bedtime sometimes he would even carry her out on to the moors and altogether he paid her more attention than he had been wont to do this made his wife more jealous than ever and although at the time it prevented her from ill-treating the child it only made matters worse afterwards one afternoon when she had somewhat gained strength he carried her out across the court and up the nine steps on to the library terrace i am going to take you into the library he said as he set her down while he opened the door aline was pleased as it was now some weeks since she had entered the room he seated her in the glorious oriel window at the end with its beautiful tracery and fine glass and put her feet up on the window seat the lower part of the window was open and revealed a wonderful view of the rolling purple moors while in the foreground was the glassy moat blue as the heaven above bright and beautiful as though nothing untoward had ever happened there it is a nice quiet retreat this he said but it was more suited to your great-great-grandfather who built it than to me my father used to spend a great deal of time here as a young man but latterly he was almost entirely at his other place in devon as it suited his health of course that is gone now we are living in hard times although we still hold the old middleton property which is our principal estate holwick is only a very small place but he always took an interest in this library and right up to the last he used to send books up here to add to the collection but his own visits here must have been very rare what was my great-grandmother like did you ever see her sire said aline yes aline gillespie was a very beautiful woman and exceedingly clever she was also very gentle and a universal favourite my great-grandfather james mowbray was almost heartbroken when she married although he was warmly attached to your great-grandfather angus but it meant that she had to go and live in scotland my grandfather was fond of her too although he was always a little bit jealous do you remember her sire i saw her now and then and remember that she used to give me presents 
one was this well-wrought italian buckle which i still wear on my belt she was very fond of books too and there was some talk of my great-grandfather having intended to leave her half the books in this library but he died rather suddenly and i imagine therefore that he had not time to carry out his intention i suppose then that she would often sit where i am sitting now how interesting it is to picture it all oh yes she had a special ambry in the wall that old james mowbray had made for her it is there behind that panel with the small ornamental lock i think that the key of it will be about somewhere the library keys used to be kept in the little drawer in this table at the end i did not know that there was a drawer said aline i fancy it is made the way it is on purpose so as not to be very conspicuous you cannot call it a secret drawer though i doubt if that kind of thing was in the old man's line although he had some strange fancies yes here they are he said pulling out the drawer see this is the ambre he went on opening the cupboard as he spoke would you like it for your own treasures very much indeed then you can have it aline's face lit up with pleasure oh thank you so much that is delightful i am not certain what these other keys are for said master mowbray this is i think the key of that old kist which used to have some papers that were at one time of importance relating to the house if you like to rummage over old things you may enjoy having a look at them i think that you are a good girl and that i may trust you but you must remember always to lock it and put everything back one of the other keys is of course the key of the rods that hold the books and the remaining key i have forgotten you had better take your own key off the bunch but keep them all in the drawer as before he put the keys in the drawer and came back and sat on the seat opposite her i've never heard you read he said and audrey tells me that you are a fine reader i have almost forgotten how to read myself so little do i practise it nowadays are you tired child would you read me something yes sire if it would please you she said you can call me cousin richard he replied i remember how my aunt your great-grandmother whom you slightly resemble once read to me in this very room when i was a boy oh what did she read there was one story a poem about a father who had lost his little daughter and saw a vision of her in heaven oh pearl a lovely musical thing with all the words beginning with the same letters i do not mean all the words i do not know how to explain it you know what i mean then there was another one about a green girdle and a lady that kissed a knight yes sir gawaine and the green knight it is a pretty tale but i think what i liked best of all was sir thomas malory that is what audrey likes best said aline she thinks that some of the books that i read are too dry because they are not stories but i am not sure that i too do not like the mort de author best of all read me something out of that she turned to the well-known scene of the passing of arthur master mowbray leaned back against the window jamb and looked across at her in the opposite corner the late afternoon sun was warm and golden she was wearing a little white dress which took on a rich glow in the mellow light over her hair and shoulder played the colours from the glass in the upper part of the window she knew the story practically by heart and her big eyes looking across at him seemed to grow larger and rounder with wonder and mystery as she told the tale under the spell of the soft witching music of her voice he was transported to that enchanted land and there he saw the dying king and sir bedivere failing to throw the sword into the water but go again lightly for thy long tarrying putteth me in great jeopardy of my life for i have taken cold for thou wouldest for my rich sword see me dead 
then followed the passage where sir bedivere throws in the sword and the mystic barge comes with the three queens and as richard mowbray looked over at the little face before him he saw in the one face the beauty of them all so on the wings of a perfect tale perfectly told he forgot the perplexities and anxieties that encompassed him and himself floated to the land of avalon while he gazed and like ian menstry was lured by the same charm and began to wonder whether she were not indeed herself from the land of fairy for i will go to the vale of avalon he repeated to himself to heal me of my grievous wound yes this is a healing of the wounds of life he added i never realized before that beauty had such power come child it is time we went he said aloud and gently lifted her in his arms we must see what the others are doing so he carried her out on to the terrace that ran in front of the library and down the steps and across the quadrangle to the great hall there they found considerable excitement a packman with five horses had arrived from the south and every one was making purchases who had any money laid by now that is a fine carpet he was saying as he unrolled a piece of flemish work it was made at ispahan for the shah of persia and is the best bit of persian carpet you will ever see that would look well in my lady's boudoir i would let you have that for five florins he did not seem very pleased at the master's entrance at that moment richard mowbray glanced at it and remarked but that is flemish weaving did i not say flemish he said oh it is flemish right enough it was made for the duke of flanders and if i had said it was tuscan i suppose it would have been made for the duke of tuscany ah master you make mock of me see here i have some buckles of chaste design that might take your fancy or these daggers of spanish make or what say you to a ring or a necklace for one of the ladies we have no monies for gods and vanities but beauty will not bide and when you have the money it may be too late you would not let it go ungraced prithee try these garnets on the lady of holwick they would become her well or the simple silver chain for the young mistress looking at aline for the first time by my troth she is a beautiful child he exclaimed involuntarily ah oh, well then my friend good wine needs no bush nay sweets to the sweet and for fair maids fair things truly you are a courtier i and have been at court and those of most courtesy have bought most of my wares enough enough what have you of good household stuff things that a good housewife must buy though the times be hard come show my lady such things as good linen and good cloth you bring him to the point said mistress mowbray yes sirrah what have you in the way of linen i have linen of france and linen of flanders i have linen fine and linen coarse he unrolled several samples as he spoke and mistress mowbray selected some linen of wrens of fine texture which she said would do to make garments for audrey and herself and your supply of clothes that you brought from scotland is a need of some plenishing she said glancing at aline there will be work for idle hands here this stout dallas footnote a very coarse sort of canvas used for underclothes by the poorest classes in the sixteenth century end of footnote will stand wear well and be warmer too 
aileen felt the blood rush to her face but she said nothing it was not that she thought much about her clothes indeed she had the natural simple taste of the high-born that eschews finery yet a certain daintiness and delicacy she did desire and had always had and it was a bitter disappointment a disappointment made more cruel by the public shame of it walter margrove the packman looked at her he had not travelled amongst all sorts and conditions for nothing and he took the situation in at a glance yes mistress mowbray aileen said at length i shall have a great deal to do richard mowbray had left the hall but old elspeth who was standing by said i will help you childie mistress mowbray scowled at her and muttered well i hope aileen that you will work hard then turning to margrove she asked to look at other wares such opportunities did not often occur in a remote place like holwick and it was very difficult to do one's purchasing at a distance so although she only bought things of real necessity she laid in a large supply from the packman's stock on these occasions the surrounding tenants were allowed to come up to the hall and walter margrove when mistress mowbray had departed started to put his things together to take them into the courtyard the children stayed behind to watch him for a few moments and as he was leaving the hall he pressed a small packet into aileen's hand and said in a whisper do not say anything it is a pleasure just a small remembrance the packet contained the small silver necklace that he had been showing before it was not of great intrinsic value but was of singularly chaste design and though exceedingly simple was of much beauty aileen was immensely surprised at the unexpected joy and for the time it quite made up to her for her previous disappointment as the packman went into the courtyard a great crowd gathered round him both chaffering and gossiping who is the beautiful young mistress that has come to holwick he asked oh she is a distant cousin of master mowbray said one but you have no idea of the things that have been going on since you were last at holwick what things why the child has been nearly killed said old elspeth who had followed the packman out poor wee soul it makes my old heart bleed to think of it even now elspeth then recounted the tale of all that had taken place then why is mistress holwick not more grateful she seems to have saved her and her good man a pretty penny indeed the woman is crazed with jealousy or envy or what not said another but the child seems a lovable one to my thinking said margrove there has never been a better lassie in holwick in my way of looking at it it was janet arnside who was speaking she had come up to see elspeth and take the opportunity of buying a few trifles at the same time my boy just owes his life to her she has been down to us times without number and i have never seen anything like the way that she gets hold of one's heart i cried the whole day long when i heard of her being hurt like that and it just makes me rage to hear the things that they tell of mistress holwick and the child it would have been the worst thing that ever happened to holwick if anything really serious had befallen her that night ay ay said several voices in chorus and why should not the bairn have fine linen i should like to know she went on it is a downright shame said a man's voice well neighbour said janet i am not the one to interfere in other folks business but i am not the only one that the child has blessed not the only one by a long way know that you are not mistress no indeed think of my wife's sickness think of my little lass i and mine and my old father said one voice after another can we not do something neighbours said janet 
why not speak to master richard himself it is an ill thing to meddle between husband and wife said margrove by my holder dame i have a half mind to speak to the jade myself she cannot hurt me no but she can hurt the child more when you have gone rejoined elspeth look here it is not much but it is something let us get the linen ourselves and it will help master margrove honest man at the same time i shall be seen to the making of the clothes and i can make a tale for the child and prevent her speaking to mistress mowbray the mistress does not pay that much attention to the little lady's belongings i can tell you she leaves it all to me and bless you if she sees any linen garments i shall tell her that they are of those that came from scotland ay ay agreed agreed they all shouted give us the very best linen you have master and some of your finest lace and we will clothe her like a princess under her kirtle if faith you are the right sort but it is no profit i will be making on this business no you shall have the things at the price i paid for them and not a groat more no nope, not even for carriage and i will give her some pieces of lace myself see here are some fine pieces of italian work this is a beautiful little piece of punto in aria and this is a fine piece of merletti a piombini but stay she shall have too a finer piece still something like the second one it is flemish dentels a fuso from Malines. he drew it forth as he spoke and fingered it lovingly amid marked expressions of admiration from elspeth and the other woman it's nothing to some beans that i will give her interposed silas the irrepressible farm reeve they are french you know from paris imitating walter's manner be quiet stop your nonsense they all shouted i am not quite sure he went on dreamily and quite unperturbed whether i shall thread them on a string to wear on her bosom or cook them for her to wear inside but certainly she shall have them for nothing not a groat will i take i should scorn to ask the price they cost me jock the stableman stepped forward and struck out playfully at silas he always carries on like that he said but silas dodged aside and put out his leg so that jock stumbled and collapsed in confusion into walter's arms a judgment on the stableman for insulting the reeve said silas marching off with mock solemnity as he reached the gate he turned back no offence walter put me down for ten florins for our bonny little mistress i'll bring it anon the others gasped at the largeness of the sum as the good-natured face of the reeve disappeared through the archway soon after the crowd thinned away and walter was packing up his things when aline happened to come to the hall door he saw her and went quickly to her and before she could thank him for his present of the necklace he said if at any time there's anything that you would like me to do out in the wide world a message for instance remember that i am always ready to help you i do not think that there is anything just now she said then god be with you and he was gone end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Child of the Moat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Child of the Moat by Ian Bernard Stoughton Holborn. Chapter Eleven Swords and Questionings. Aline had rather overtaxed her strength and had a slight setback, so that it was some time before she was strong enough to climb down the stairs and visit Ian again. He was feeling very dejected that day. His collarbone and his ankle had healed, but although in some ways better, he was beginning to feel the want of fresh 
air and it told not only upon his health but his spirits he was also desperately anxious to get on to carlisle where it was arranged that he should hand over the papers to john erskine of down but he was by no means fit to travel on his dangerous errand the worrying however made him worse and what he felt he required was some gentle exercise to get up his strength altogether it was with keener pleasure even than usual that he saw aline come oh i am so glad to see you he said audrey has been telling me the dreadful things that have happened but i want you to tell me something yourself sit down and make yourself as comfortable as you can but i am not an invalid now said aline and do not need special comfort how are you are you not tired of being shut up here yes indeed and you too will be wanting some fresh air to put you to rights again audrey says that you did not suffer much pain is that so but it must have been a terrible shock you may well take some time to recover i am getting on marvellously well said aline and i have been thinking that you might be getting out a little bit you could sit out near the mouth of the cave if one of us kept watch and after dark it would even be safe to walk a little yes i have been thinking that myself he replied i have been looking round this room to while away the time and have found some interesting things i wonder by the way what is in that old iron chest there it does not seem to have any lock which is most strange yes we must find that out said aline but really so many things have happened and there has been so much to do that we have not had time to think about it well amongst other things i have found some rapiers he said and have been practising thrusts and parries by way of getting a little exercise but one cannot do much by oneself two men imprisoned in this place might keep themselves in fair condition although it is rather short of air for such activity however that cannot be oh let me see the rapiers said aline ah here they are and helmets and leather jerkins and gloves i am going to dress up she added laughing there now what do i look like you must dress up too i want to see how they suit you ian put on a helmet and the other things while aline executed a graceful little dance round the room when he had finished she said roguishly do you know anything about fencing i have seen people fence they stand something like this putting her right foot rather too far forward and turning it outward and not bending the knee sufficiently shall i teach you no but i might teach you said ian quite innocently well but do you know anything about it and aline smiled mischievously i ought to do when i was a wanderer in italy i learned a great deal that is entirely unknown here stand on guard then and show me something as he moved she appeared to copy his attitude engage and mechanically from long use he brought down his sword in a flash she disengaged and cut over he parried she made a remise and was in upon him with a hit over the heart aline burst out laughing while ian was thunderstruck she took off her helmet saying we must not have any more to-day as i am not well enough but we shall have some fine times later on it was rather a shame though but i could not help it it was such fun i was a little afraid that you would be too taken aback to parry it all and that would have been very dull i hope you are a good fencer really there was said to be no one in scotland who could come anywhere near my father oh that is how you come to know so much about it 
said ian sitting down even the slight effort had been too much yes my father taught me and told me that i was getting on very well but i have had no practice since i came to holwick some eight months ago things are much harder than they used to be father used to give me much of his time you see he had no boys and so he always said that he would like me to know the things that boys know and yet i do not know that i am altogether fond of them but i have always loved swimming and fencing is delightful somehow i never cared particularly about riding but i have come to like it in the last week or two since i have started again it takes me away from the hall that is a great thing i always loved riding said ian there is nothing like a good horse at a canter and the wind rushing over one's face yes i do not know why it was of course we never had good horses after i was eight years old why do you want to get away from the hall aline did not speak at first then she said well you see it makes a change is it mistress mowbray that is the real cause come little one tell me truthfully doesn't she treat you well there is always a great deal to do cleaning and mending and when there is nothing else there is always spinning and carding well i suppose that we must all of us do our share of work aline could not keep back the tears which welled into her eyes and made them glisten yes it's not really the work i should not mind the work indeed i am used to very hard work indeed because before the end i used to have to do almost everything at home what does she do to you child has she been losing her temper again come tell me i do not like to say but she does all kinds of things well never mind if you do not want to tell me no i do not mind telling you it is that i am not sure how far i should say anything to any one at all but you will never see her and it does relieve one's feelings to be able to speak to any one then come and sit by me and tell me all about it aline came and sat by him on the old settee you see it is not exactly because she hits me that i mind although i have never been hit by any one before but she is always doing little petty things that in some ways are harder to bear than being knocked about for instance when we sit down to breakfast there are always two pitchers of milk which we have with our porridge they are neither of them quite full and she takes one of them and pours out some for herself and cousin richard then she looks into it to see what is left and generally pours most of it into the other pitcher after that she hands the full one to audrey and the one with only a little drop in the bottom to me does audrey know of course not dear audrey i am sure if it would benefit audrey i would go without milk altogether i would not have her know for worlds she would quarrel with her mother over it what else does she do ian asked aline then told the story of the packman she did not yet know what had been done by elspeth and the others about the linen but she pulled up the necklace which she was wearing under her dress and shewed it to ian now is that not pretty i have always wanted a necklace and father had promised only a little while before he died that as soon as he could afford it he would get me one so i try to think of it as if it was father's present the tears again gathered in the beautiful eyes and this time one rolled over on to her cheek she brushed it away hastily but ian drew her gently towards him and kissed her for the first time sweet little maiden he said i hope that god will be good to you after what you have been through in your young life i do not like the priest here she continued of course i like father lawrence 
but middleton is too far away and when i went to confession the other day i said something to father ambrose about father but he was not a bit kind and sympathetic like our dear old priest at home i always keep a candle burning for father that is what i mainly spend my money on and i wanted him to tell me how long he thought it would be before my father's soul would get to heaven do you think it will be very long and will my candles help him somehow i do not see why god should make any difference because of our candles suppose my father had had no little girl to burn candles or suppose that i had had no money that would have been worse still these things are very difficult sweet child but i am sure that the love of your little heart that happens to show itself in buying the candles must meet with its own reward whether candles themselves are necessary or not but i am afraid that i cannot be of much use to you little one because i am no longer of the old faith tell me something about that then father said that he would tell me when i got older i do not want to unsettle you ian said but of one thing i feel sure that god would never deal harshly with a child that believed what it had been taught when we get older it is different just as it is in the other responsibilities of life that is largely why we are put here in this world to learn to think for ourselves and to take up responsibilities things are not made too easy for us or we should not have the high honour that god has given us of largely building our own characters of making ourselves aline sat quiet and thoughtful for some time master menstrie she said at length i am not so very young now and i think that i should like to begin to know something about these things you have not read the bible i suppose said ian no it is wicked to read the bible why the priests say so but how do you know that they are right after all what is the bible it is the word of god and although even the bible was written by human beings it is largely the words of our lord himself and the writings of people who actually knew him or lived in that very time ian talked to her for some time and then aline said that she would like to read the bible there is no reason why you should not he said but you must remember that you are undertaking a great responsibility and that though it may bring great joy and comfort it will be the beginning of sorrow too and you are very young he added looking at her wistfully i have a little english translation of the new testament he went on after a pause which i can lend you but audrey was telling me the other day that you could read greek oh only easy greek said aline i have read some of aesop and that is quite easy but father and i used to read homer together and that was delightful although more difficult did you read much what did you like best oh yes i read a great deal at least it was really father reading at any rate at first i did not do much more than follow but i got so used to it at last that i could read it without great difficulty there was so much that i liked that i could not say what i liked best but there was little that was more delightful than the story of nesica i shall never forget her parting with odysseus father told me that the lady jane grey read and enjoyed plato and demosthenes when she was about the age i am now besides knowing french and italian thoroughly i have read a little plato and have tried demosthenes but i did not care about him so much i love plato said ian after the bible there is nothing so helpful in the world you seem to have done very well little maid but can you read latin that is amusing she said because i was going to ask you if you could read latin now i shall want to know if you can read greek or if you read in latin translations oh yes she went on 
i can read latin quite easily i dare say there is some latin that i cannot read but anything at all ordinary i can manage yet i do not like latin as well as greek and the things that are written in latin are not half as interesting i quite agree with you i learnt latin as a boy but when i was in venice working on some great iron hinges my employer who was a great scholar took an interest in me and he enabled me to get a fair knowledge of greek i have steadily practised it since and can now read anything except some of the courses and things like that without difficulty however if you can read latin there is no need for you to read an english translation at all and it is much safer as the priests do not mind any one who can read latin reading the bible nearly so much as those who cannot i expect that there will be a copy of the vulgate in the library although it is very unlikely that there will be anything in the original greek though there might be the septuagint what is the vulgate then oh a translation of the bible into latin it is really a revised edition of the old latin translation made in the time of pope damasus and after largely by saint jerome in the fourth century i shall go and have a look as soon as i can ian sat and looked at her without speaking she certainly was a most unusual child but he was by no means anxious to trouble her mind with disturbing perplexities there is a good deal to be said even for the priests he reflected responsibility may be too crushing altogether well i have to go and do some spinning and mistress mowbray will be wondering where i am but you will give me lessons in greek will you not certainly we will start next time you come to see me see if you can find some greek books in the library good-bye aline departed and sat at the wheel till supper and then went up with audrey to their room what was her surprise as she looked at her bed to see it covered with neatly folded little piles of beautiful linen child as she was she knew at once that both the linen and lace upon it were of exceptional quality oh audrey dear what is all this she exclaimed well you will never guess will she elspeth said audrey turning to the old nurse who had stolen in to see how the gift would be received nobody could bear that you should wear dowless henny said the old dame and so practically every one in the neighbourhood has had a hand in what you see there janet arnside made this camise and martha the laundry maid made that night robe joseph the stableman and silas bought the bits of lace on this edward bought this large a piece of punto in aria here i made these with the teleterata work with my own hands and i do hope you will like them indeed i do said aline bewildered as much by the demonstration of widespread affection as by the altogether unexpected acquisition elspeth you are a dear and oh it is good of them but what will mistress mowbray say mistress mowbray is not to know that's what they all said if she did marry she would say that we were all doited and you would not let her think of that would you dearie said the old woman slyly you will be careful not to get us into trouble for we meant it kindly aline was quite overcome and they went through every piece and learnt its history i cannot help liking nice things said aline and why should you not exclaimed the old woman it is only vulgar when you put dress before other things or think about it every day old mistress mowbray your grandmother my dear turning to audrey used often to say that it was the mark of a lady to dress well but simply and not to think much about it 
i should much prefer simple clothes except for great occasions said aline if only for the sake of making the great occasion more special but even then i like the rich broad effects that father used to talk about with long lines and big masses and full drapery rather than elaborate things some of these newer styles i do not like at all yes i agree with you audrey chimed in but i should like to wear velvet other than black and i have always longed to have some ermine well unless they alter the laws of the land for your benefit childy you will have to marry a baron but you should be thankful for what you've got i should soon be tried in the court footnote the sumptuary laws regulated what each rank was allowed to wear End of footnote. if i started wearing black velvet said elspeth does your ambition soar to diamonds and pearls audrey asked aline laughing no i will leave them to the princesses and duchesses but look here aline said audrey with an air of triumph picking up a particularly beautiful smock i bought all the material with my own money and made it every bit myself and elspeth says i have done it very well you darling said aline and kissed her cousin again and again oh i do feel so happy but you have not finished said audrey and here's a parcel you have not undone aline picked it up and turned it over on it was written from mistress mowbray a parcel from mistress mowbray how strange and the little smooth white brow became slightly wrinkled inside she found a note and a second wrapping the note ran as follows to aline gillespie finding that others are concerned about your garments i have made it my duty to let you have something really appropriate to your condition at holwick and that will express the feelings with which i shall always regard you i trust you will think of me when you wear the necklace although the contents of the pendant are another's gift eleanor mowbray x her mark how does she regard me and what is appropriate to my condition queried aline as she undid the second wrapper to her astonishment and amusement it contained an old potato sack made into the shape of a camise after what mistress mowbray had said about the coarse dowless aline was half inclined to believe the gift was genuine but as she smiled there fell out a red necklace made of small pieces of carrot with an enormous potato as a pendant now whoever has done this she cried breaking into a merry peal and looking at audrey and elspeth they both shook their heads she examined the potato and found that it had been scooped out and held a packet very tightly rolled up within which was a piece of walter's choicest lace on the packet was written to somebody from somebody's enemy from whose enemy said aline mine who chased whom round the walls of what audrey observed i expect the two somebodies are not the same well but whom is it from at this moment aline caught sight of the upper part of a head trying to peep round at the door it vanished instantly she paused for a moment and then gave chase down the newel stairs round and round and round lightly flashed the little feet and she could hear great heavy footsteps at much longer intervals going down apparently three steps at a time some way below her she reached the bottom just in time to see the figure of silas dash into the screens but he vanished altogether before she had time to catch him and thank him for what was obviously his gift 
the next day after dinner aline ran out gaily across the quadrangle lightly reached the eighth step in two bounds covering the remaining step and the terrace in two more and was in the library ready to prosecute her search she had a long hunt for the latin bible in which after much diligence she was successful she then thought that she would try the key of the old chest and on opening it found it half full of ancient parchments concerning the estate she discovered that they were quite interesting but she did not linger looking at them just then the chest was divided one-third of the way from the front longitudinally up to about half its height and it was possible to put all the parchments into the front half aline moved all the papers and then got into the back part of the chest to see what it felt like before she did anything else just as she did so she heard the library door open and her blood ran cold in a flash she wondered whether it would be better to get out of the chest or to shut the lid she decided on the latter and was just able to shut down the lid quietly when she heard the footsteps that had first gone into the other part of the library turn back in her direction she had luckily taken the key in her hand with which the chest could be locked on the inside and succeeded in fastening it with hardly any noise the steps approached the chest and then a voice said i thought aline was in here and what was that noise it was audrey's voice so aline ventured to laugh good gracious what is that exclaimed audrey and after a click the lid of the chest to her still greater astonishment lifted itself up she sprang back and then in her turn broke into laughter as aline's head emerged from the chest what a fright you gave me said each of the children simultaneously and then they both laughed again you dear thing aline and audrey flung her arms round her cousin oh i am glad that it is you but you must be very careful about that kiss i do not think that we had better use it unless one of us is on guard how did you find the key cousin richard gave it to me i forgot to tell you but he does not know anything about the secret room as oddly enough he happened to say when speaking of secret drawers that he did not think that old james mowbray had any fancies of that kind he would have found that he had rather elaborate fancies of that kind if he knew what we know would he not you little wonder girl what adventures you do have whatever will you drag me into next anyhow i never had adventures till i met you so perhaps it is due to you oh no you not i are the wonder girl right enough you have great adventures by yourself let us come down and see ian said aline all right you go down this way audrey replied i want to know how it acts i'll wait to see you safe down and then i will go round the other way no you would like to try the new way i will go round thank you very well a few minutes later the children met again in the secret room and audrey explained how simple and convenient the new way was aline then produced the bible and after a little talk she read several chapters translating as she went it was a new world to the children and ian watched their faces eagerly as she read audrey in her impulsive way was taken with the simplicity of the story aline who was an unusually thoughtful child was surprised but reserved her opinion it was the beginning of many such readings at first ian said nothing but when they had finished reading two of the gospels and began to ask questions he talked with them and explained many difficulties 
what amazed aline was the entire absence of any allusion to any of the ceremonial that had seemed to her young mind to form so large a part of religion also the simplicity of the appeal to come directly to the divine without any intermediary attracted her greatly in a way that perhaps it would not have done when the old parish priest of her earlier days was a really beloved friend ian was disturbed in mind he saw that the children were gradually but surely being influenced and that the old faith would never be the same again but it must mean trouble and affliction the district where they were was staunchly catholic and the measures that mary's advisers were taking were stern and cruel that little face with its associations of bygone years and its own magical attractive power that seemed to hold all but a few of every one with whom aline came into contact how could he bring lines of pain there and yet how could he withhold what meant so much to himself this which seemed to be a new and living light then that awful vision of george wishart rose up again before him and with a vivid intensity he thought he saw the form of little aline standing by him in the heart of the flames there was too that awful prophecy of the horrible old woman about aline's path being through the fire surely there could be nothing in it the perspiration stood on ian's brow he caught his breath slowly the vision cleared away and there were the children seated before him what if things however should come to this his very soul was in agony torn this way and that end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the child of the moat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the child of the moat by ian bernard stoughton holborn chapter twelve mall of the graves holwick generally pursued the even tenor of its way from year's end to year's end with nothing more eventful than a birth a death or a marriage aline's adventure therefore was likely to remain a staple topic of conversation for many years but now there was a strange feeling in the air as though something further were going to happen an atmosphere of uneasiness enveloped the place an atmosphere oppressive like a day before a thunderstorm it was nothing definite nothing explicable but every one seemed conscious of it it pervaded holwick it pervaded newbiggin on the other side of the river ian and the children were particularly aware of it the placid life of the tees valley was to be stirred by things at least as striking as andrew's villainy it might have been old moll's ravings it might have been the stirrings of religious troubles that had started the apprehension but there it was something not immediate but delayed a presentiment too vague even to be discussed one day thomas woolridge was walking down from the hall through the rocky ravine under holwick crags it was a dull grey day with a strong wind and the rocks seemed to tower up with an oppressive austerity out of all proportion to their size he was in a gloomy frame of mind and kicked at the stones in his path sullenly watching them leap and bound down the hill steadily there neighbour said a voice from below do you want to kill some one and the head of silas morgan the farm reeve appeared above the rocks beneath methinks i should not mind and i did answered thomas provided it were one of the right sort 
i am tired of slaving away under other folks orders who are they that they should have a better time than i have i should like to know they all have their orders too man who do you think you are that you should have it all your own way there is master mowbray now who has just set forth to york because the sheriff bade him and a fine cursing and swearing there was too i'll warrant ye said thomas master mowbray doth not mince matters when he starts a-going no but he doth not pull a face as long as a bass viol thomas if so be that i had a face like yours i would put my hat on it and walk backwards be of good cheer you rascal no one doth as he pleaseth from the queen's grace downwards that may be so neighbour but you'll not deny that some have an unfair share of this world's gear no by my troth that is so but i do not see how you are going to set it right besides odds fish man you would never even get as large a share as you do you lazy varlet if you got what was meat i have never seen you do a stroke of work that you could avoid and silas gave thomas a dig in the ribs here now sir you let me alone thomas said gruffly why should we not all fare alike all fare alike old sulky face not for me i thank you i would not work for a discontented windbag like you what's your particular grumble just now i'm not grumbling not at all you are saying what a happy life it is and how glad you are to see your fellow creatures enjoying themselves thomas lifted a stone and threw it but silas jumped aside and it flew down the rocks i'm not grumbling so much at the mowbrays but at that gillespie wench there have always been mowbrays up there but that wench she has nothing of her own why should she not addle her bread the same as you or i one day she had the impertinence to start ordering me about and made old edward and myself look a pair of fools the old ass did not mind but i did and i am not going to forget i am sick of these craven villagers louting footnote the earlier form of curtsy End of footnote. and curtsying at the minx and she no better than any of us she gets on my nerves party with her pretty angel face well i am glad you admit you are grumbling at something but you have less cause to grumble at mistress aline than any one in holwick you graceless loon so here's something else to grumble at and silas gave thomas a sudden push which made him roll over and then he ran off laughing you unneighbourly ruffian i'll pay you out said thomas as he ruefully picked himself up and started down the steep he went on to the hamlet and on his way back he met aline who was going down to see joan moulton beyond all expectations by getting audrey to sue for her aline had arranged that joan should be moved to durham and she was going to pay her last visit it's a fine day mistress aline observed thomas as he reached her i hope you are keeping well the falcon is doing splendidly i notice i shall never forget your kindness to me by the way i found some white heather the other day and i meant to tell you i took up the root and transplanted it in your garden oh that was you thomas you are good i noticed it at once but somehow i thought it was mistress audrey's doings i love white heather i am fain it please you well good day mistress aline there's no time to waste and some of us have to work very hard betimes on the way up to the hall just before he reached the crags of the ravine he saw some one else it was old moll o the graves how now neighbour he said i've not seen you for a long time but what's the good of your hocus-pocus where's that fine hank of wool i gave you and those two cheeses and the bowl of meal that gillespie bitch is still running round and you said that before a year was away she would be gone but andrew's little play didn't work damn the fellow she's alive yet i tell you 
and he put his hand on the old woman's shoulder as though to shake her hands off you coward said the old hag why do you not do your own dirty work andrew was worth half a dozen of you pa you devil's spawn if you touch me i'll burn your entrails with fire day and night and send you shrieking and praying for your own death but i tell you that skelpie may not have to die by water there are other ways of dying than being drowned i cannot read all the future but you mark my word and i have never been wrong yet she will be gone by the time i named little joan will go as i said and if we are safely rid of one you need not fear for the other the stars and their courses fight on our side and she laughed an evil laugh there is no room in this world for your weak-minded gentle creatures bah cowards worms with their snivelling pity does nature feel pity when the field mouse is killed by the hawk does nature feel pity when a mother dies of the plague does god feel pity when we starve a child or beat it to death let him show his pity for the victims of disease for the beings he has brought into the world humpbacked blind halt imbecile ha 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 no the forces on our side are the stronger and the innocent the gentle and loving must go i hate innocence i hate love and hate will triumph in the end do you think i love you you coward and she advanced slowly as though to clutch his throat with her skinny hand laughing her demoniacal laugh you are on our side but you are a worm thomas i spit at you be gone thomas looked at her in terror and slunk away till the old woman's mocking laughter grew fainter Fah! she was mad mad what did it matter and yet suppose she took it into her head to put a spell on him the same as she had done on little joan what then but he would be even with aileen yet andrew was a clumsy bungler he would see if he could not secure a more efficient agent thomas had allowed his imagination to dwell round his grievance against aileen until it had grown to colossal dimensions she could not even smile on any one without him reckoning it up against her as an offence the thing was becoming an obsession with him but what did the old crone mean something certainly was going to happen did it involve thomas or was he himself to be unaffected by the play of forces the feeling was unpleasant and he could not shake it off after meeting thomas aline had gone on to peter's cottage she found that the dying child was weaker than ever but she still seemed to cling tenaciously to life she raised herself a little when Aileen came in, and her eyes shone with an unnatural brightness. "'I shall never see you any more, Aileen,' she said, "'and I have several things that I want to say to you. They are going to take me away. I know they mean to be kind, yet I would rather have died quietly here. But listen, it is not about that that I want to talk,' the child went on excitedly hush dear said aline taking the small frail hand in her own and stroking it you will tire yourself out can you put your hand under my pillow aline you will find there a little packet aline did as she was asked now undo it she opened the small parcel and found in it half a groat that had been broken in two a child's spinning top and a short lock of dark curly brown hair he was my playmate said joan and he used to help me every day to carry the water from the spring up to the house and he said that when he was a big man he would marry me i know i am going to die soon and no one loves me but you so i want to give you my secret oh joan darling you must not talk like that and aline stooped and kissed the sad little face on the pillow 
while her tears in spite of herself would keep welling up and rolling down her cheeks a faint little smile spread over joan's face as her thoughts wandered away back to the old times in kirkoswald and talking half to herself and half to aline she said his name was wilfred johnstone oh wilfred wilfred if only i could kiss you good-bye but i shall leave your top and the half groat and your dear hair with my beautiful little lady and some day she may see you and give them back and say good-bye for me oh aline she went on trying to raise herself as she put her arms round her neck give him this kiss for me and say that if i had grown up i would have been his little wife as i promised then pressing a kiss on aline's lips she fell back exhausted on the bed i will do everything you ask said aline and sat by her for a long time but the child did not speak again at last the evening began to get dark and aline knew she must be getting home good-bye sweet joan she said and for the last time printed a kiss on the child's forehead i wish you could have said good-bye and she turned to the door as she turned joan's eyes half opened good-bye she murmured and aline went sadly from the house they are going to take her away from me and i believe i love her even more than audrey but it is all meant for the best oh i hope and i hope that that horrid old witch was not telling the truth aline lay awake for a long time that night thinking of joan and old moll and wondering how she would find wilfred johnstone and when she slept she still dreamed of her little friend the next morning they carried joan away on a litter the journey was to be made in three stages of a day each aline would have liked to see her off but unfortunately master richard had specially arranged to take the children with him on a long expedition and to make an early start and he did not wish any interference with his plans he had been so very kind in making the elaborate arrangements about joan's journey and future welfare that aline did not like to say anything though it cost her a pang they mounted from the old looping on stone in the lower courtyard and were not long reaching middleton master richard had some business in middleton and afterward they turned up the left bank of the tees it was another grey day but the water looked wonderfully beautiful down below them and holwick crags rose majestically away to the left the bleakness of the surrounding country enhanced the richness of the river valley but the wild spirit of the hills seemed to dominate the whole on the way they passed through the village of newbiggin it consisted almost wholly of rude stone cottages and byres we have a great deal of trouble here remarked richard mowbray they are a curiously lawless lot it is not only their poaching but there is much thieving of other kinds their beasts too are a nuisance straying as they pretend on our middleton property a murrain on them my tenant there master milnes is very indignant about it and is sure that it is not accidental he also makes great complaint about continual damage to the dykes mistress mowbray is determined to have the whole nest of them cleared out but the village does not belong to you does it cousin richard no there are three properties besides mine that meet there the duke of alston's lord middleton's and master gower's then how are you going to do anything oh mistress mowbray saw lord middleton and he has arranged that his reeve and the duke's shall come over to holwick and meet master gower and ourselves i do not expect there will be any difficulty aline thought it was rather a high-handed proceeding but she said nothing she looked at the little cottages and then her thoughts flew over to the cottage on the other side of the river that joan had just left 
she wondered rather pathetically whether nearly all life was sad like her own and joan's and ian's did every one of these cottages mean a sad story it would certainly be a sad story to be turned out of one's home here was a new trouble for her was it true she thought that all these people were as bad as cousin richard supposed suddenly audrey exclaimed look there goes old moll as they overtook her she stopped and shook her staff after them crying maidens that ride high horses to-day eat bitter bread upon the morrow master mowbray did not catch what she said but aline heard and again felt that peculiar shudder that she could not explain a week or two later the words came back to her with bitter meaning indeed joan safely reached her destination and the first news that came from durham was hopeful but shortly afterwards the news was worse and then suddenly came word that she was dead aline put the little packet carefully away in the ombre she did not tell any one not even audrey but some day she hoped to carry out the child's request there was too much misery in the world she must see what she could do perhaps she might begin by doing something for the people of newbiggin at least she could find out what was the real truth of the case End of chapter 12